looking at? So I, I, it's a, um, it's pieced. It's all uh, hand pieced. And if you can see in the background, they're all one inch squares. And um, it's all, the whole thing is um, oh white God. and off white. Yeah, and it's cut out. So those, where you see the gray is, it's, um, you know, it's it's cut, it's, you can see. And it's hand applique the, with the trapunto on the sort of the Celtic um, markings, if you will. So the, and every single one of the little one inch pieces has a different quilting motif. Wow, that's amazing. That's <laughs> yeah, amazing. That was really fun. Did you plan, and then it's got, did, you plan it's got, it, did you plan out those or did you just sort of, whatever struck you when you got to each little square? No, whatever struck me when I got to the square. Yeah, yeah. I just tried to make them all different. So it was really fun to quilt. And it's got antique uh, lace on it and like a hand, uh, the antique handkerchief over the, the center of the cross. And then I hand beaded it um, on the handkerchief and then all the way around the outside. And then there's, what's on the side? So you have it bound, almost looks like satin. Is it bound with satin? It's it, no, it's cotton, but I have these glass um, and gold beads all along the side of nice. the quilt. How long did it take? And then is it based on? It says it looks like it's based on a a cemetery stone. Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, it's actually my my father is buried here now, but it was um, I was up there and um, visiting his grave, and I just. It's a very, very, very old, old cemetery in like this little tiny town. And I just saw this stone. This It's a huge cemetery marker. And I just took a picture of it. And I, my husband was with me and I came home and just immediately went to work on this. That's, remar that's remarkable. And there was the no stopping me. <laughs> How long did it take to make it, do you think? It was a long time. It Probably like I spent... Such a labor maybe five life. or six months yeah it's amazing it's really thank amazing. you and it just kind of I didn't really I'm not really a big planner I made the cross first and I and and I knew I wanted it to be somehow three-dimensional or cut out and so then I just started cutting these little pieces and sewing them together and made this background it's really cool thank you kind of, I'm kind of mesmerized <laughs> <laughs> and it's hanging in by my door now, so I kind of like that. That's really interesting. Well, I'll put I'll put a I'll put a link to it on the on the, the page too. All right. Well, this is totally not yeah. what I expected we should be chatting about. Okay. The last thing is um uh your wet you have a picture of the the double wedding ring on your website, and I'm curious yes. about uh it's really pretty. It's black and white. It's very traditional. Yeah. And sort of um, tell yeah. me more a little bit about that. I've been working on a double wedding ring. Um, cause someone sent me a pattern to try and I'm trying everything. Uh -huh. Um, and I'm curious about what your thoughts are about that. It's a very traditional pattern. Yes. And it's from my old days and I just, I, I love it. And I think it was maybe one of the ones that I, um, I'm really proud of it because I collected the fabrics, you know, this was back when I was really just kind of getting started. I, I probably spent two years collecting the fabrics because I, you know, I just, I didn't buy them online back then. I thought I just searched and searched and searched for all the right black and white fabrics. And um, the white is a real stark white. And then it's hand quilted uh, with black thread. And it's a really beautiful pattern in the, um, with the hand quilting. So yeah, I just thought it was really fun. And I love the scallop edges. And um, I thought the quilting turned out beautiful. Yeah, that it is really beautiful. I mean, I haven't obviously haven't seen it in person, but online it's really pretty. It's very striking. and it's definitely a very, very you know it's very traditional pattern. And I and I didn't do a lot of those. Yeah, that's very cool. All right, so what you're known for is your work on Japan, right? So yes. So yes. tell me more about we we've talked about it before, but in a, a bit noisier setting. So tell me a little bit about what you what work you do with japan and how you got into it so i first discovered um 
Japanese quilts and Japanese fabric at the International Quilt Festival. And um, that was probably about 10 years ago. And I just, you know, I would always view the exhibitions and spent a lot of time in there. And I just, over time, became more and more intrigued with these gorgeous, gorgeous quilts. The vast majority of them were hand quilted. And I just thought the work was so stunning and the colors of these fabrics just drew me in. And um, so I just started buying them, the fabrics, and started researching them and learning more about them. A lot of them were in the taupe palette, but not all. Um, I also became really intrigued with the, you know, the whole genre of these sort of simultaneously bright and muted fabrics. So I just became really, really interested in it. And I started, you know, trying to find the designers and reading more about the quilters. And I had a, uh, I was an executive in the oil industry for um, 20 some years. And I um, left that job in 2013. And I, I, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with my life. Um, and I decided almost within a couple of weeks span that I wasn't going to go back to corporate world. I was gonna do finally what I was passionate about. And then like, uh, just like a few moments later, I decided I was passionate about Japan and by God, I was gonna follow that passion. So I started planning this book and planning to tell the story of how quilting came to Japan. Um, and I um, put together a proposal. I had never written a book. Um, I, had, I was in corporate communications though. So I, and I used to be a journalist. So I had a, you know, a pretty strong background. And I also published an art magazine for a while. So I, I, I put together this proposal and I went to market and this was, a, you know, quite a while back and I didn't um, have any credentials to get into market, but I had this, you know, you had to have your own um, website or URL, which I had fortunately. So they let me in <laughs> and I just went and met with every single publisher at market. And there was about five of them there and they, four of them turned me down. And the fifth one was Schiffer, which was kind of who I wanted anyway. And I met with Schiffer and I told them about this idea, this book I wanted to write, and they were immediately interested. So they asked me to, you know, make changes to my proposal um, and send it in, which I did. And about a month later, they called me and gave me a contract to write this book. So then I was off and running and I, I, I made a, a reservation to go to Japan and I um, rented an apartment for a month in Tokyo and I, I don't speak Japanese, um, but I just started, I knew a couple people and they helped me enormously. Um, and so I kept emailing them, asking them for introductions and um, finally just sort of um, worked my way in. And I went there and I, I traveled all over the country and I used my apartment as sort of a base. Um, I took the trains everywhere and I, I went to about maybe 10 different or 12 different studios and homes of quilters. Um, and I just had an amazing time researching and interviewing them and going to museums and meeting with curators. And it was an amazing experience. It does sound, that sounds amazing. That really does. Um, yeah. And it sounds great. It sounds like <laughs> yeah. a dream. Yeah, it was. And I was really fortunate to be in a place where I could do it and do it full time and frankly, be able to afford it. Yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a cheap venture and books don't pay, you know, as you know, books don't pay any money. Yeah. Um, but so I went twice um, researching for that first book um, and I ended up, you know, I had to do all my own photography as well um, because, you know, these publishers can't afford to give you photography budget. So um, I had to shoot a lot of the quilts as well that were in the book as well as the quilters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the manuscript to my book consisted of the manuscript and 200 some photos that I turned in. Um, and it was very um, rewarding. It was really fun. I really enjoyed it. And so when I was researching that book, I, at the same time, I was very interested in the textiles themselves. Um, and the designs of the textiles and the printing of the textiles. 
and it really couldn't all fit into one book. You know, it was really kind of an off topic. So I decided just to focus on the quilting for the first book. Um, but these ideas were churning in my head all during that time. Um, and so I made two more trips to Japan after that um, and started really um, meeting with the textile mills and the printers. Um, my father owned a printing company, um, printing paper, not textiles. But I grew up on the, sh you know, on the floor of print shops. So I was always fascinated by this idea of printing and how it worked and why one was better than the other, you know, what was good and what was not good. And I think I knew the difference. And so I knew that these Japanese textiles, particularly the ones that were new and being printed for the, the quilting industry were far superior to anything else. And I felt like I could go into a quilt shop, you know, almost with my eyes closed and touch the fabrics. I could tell you which ones came from Japan, you know, just because of the, the beauty of the hand of these fabrics. And so I was fascinated as to why, why is that? And, you know, why are they so well done? So I started trying to meet with these printers in Japan, the textile mills, and they were very, very, very reluctant at first. <laughs> they, you know, they didn't know who I was and they didn't know why I wanted to come and tour their plants. And they're very protective of their process and they're very protective of their, um, you know, their competitive advantages because they're all competing against each other and it's, you know, it's a tight market. So I made friends with um, a company that's like a middleman uh, in the cotton trading industry, and they helped me get an entree into the first printing mill, uh, and it was just fascinating. We spent the entire day there, um, and once I got one, I was able to get another one, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I came back on a separate trip and, and toured another printing mill. Um, so I learned enormously, and then I ended up spending a lot of time talking to the different fabric manufacturers um, inside Japan, um, Yuwa and um, Lucian and Daiwabo and uh, Koka, and I met with all of them. So I was very, very interested in telling that story. And at the same time, you can't really tell that story without telling the story of cotton, mm -hmm. um, because you know quilters all use cotton and. I felt this really strong connection to cotton because I live in Texas. Mm -hmm. So I went out to Lubbock and met with cotton farmers and kind of tried to briefly, very briefly, tell the story of, you know, where all this cotton comes from, um, specifically to Japan. That's really interesting. And that's, that's the, yeah, that's the story that's in my book. <laughs> It's really interesting. We, I just had an interview with um, uh, Todd Purcell, who's at Superior Threads, and he was talking about uh -huh. cotton from Egypt and why they, um, and then they send it to Japan for creating the threads. But the and was explaining yes. why they had made those choices. Um, it's really fascinating, isn't it? Like all of the sort of the, and it is a choice. Yeah. Yeah. It is a choice because um, you can you can print, you can make thread in China or Korea, and Korea actually is really quickly catching up to Japan, but they're not there yet. But they they do some fine work in Korea, but but the others are not caught up. Um, and Moda, um, maybe I already told you this, but mm -hmm. Moda is like Superior in that they they print about forty five percent of their uh, fabrics in Japan. And why do you think that by is? choice? Right. So there's, I mean, there are a number. Aren't there a number of companies that are are choosing to, to print in Japan? Why do you think that is? Yeah, RJR and quite a few Cotton and Seal. Um, a lot of them do. You know, Japan is ex excels at a lot of things. Um, and when they set their mind to something, every single worker involved in that process is extremely dedicated and you know does their the best it doesn't matter if they're sweeping floors or working at a fast food or you know driving a taxi or engineering a complicated process the the worker in japan has enormous respect for their job they do it honorably and they respect each other so they they bring this this really beautiful traditions to their job so you know that you kind of have that behind you and when they 
when they're printing, they have this advantage over what's called fine line.